five ways SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, triggers hiatal hernia and acid reflux. This is a brand new study that just came out last week that reveals causes of hiatal hernia and acid reflux that haven't been discussed before. And it has to do with your gut bacteria, particularly small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and the five ways it's creating this increased risk for you. So we'll go over all five plus what you can do about it. So number one is excess gas production, which leads to increased pressure. So these bacteria uh, within that's well that's creating the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth those bacteria create gases hydrogen gas methane gas hydrogen sulfide gas and they cause increased pressure and it is that pressure change that pushes the stomach upward so that's pretty much of a basic mechanical uh, change that we understand, but the fact that SIBO is a culprit is, is more of a new look. Okay, then we have impaired motility due to vagus dysfunction. So your vagus nerve is your, one of your cranial nerves, number 10. And what can occur with uh, gut inflammation is it very much inflames uh, the vagus nerve. And one of the things the vagus nerve does normally is has a lot to do with motility, how things are moving through your gut. And there's a, there's a natural normal timing of this. So with impaired vagus nerve function, your stomach moves, the contents of it move too slowly. Your stomach should empty in about two to four hours. Instead, things are just sitting around too long. What occurs as a result of that is not only a not great feeling of that stomach distension, feeling like you swallowed a brick, uh, you, you, you definitely sense that digestion is not happening, it's very uncomfortable, but in addition to that, bad bacteria are multiplying, which is one of the causes of SIBO, and also with that multiplication comes pressure. But at the heart of it is this vagus nerve dysfunction because your gut is irritated. Okay, then we have uh, diaphragm compression from bloating. So we've got this increased bloating due to these bad bacteria that's creating all this gas. So how does it affect the diaphragm? The diaphragm is an organ, it's also a very strong muscle, but when you inhale, it has to bow downwards. And then of course you exhale and it, and it comes back up and it moves anywhere from two to five inches, but it, it can't go bow down as efficiently as it should if there's all this upward pressure against it, right? So what does that mean? Uh, you're not getting that full breath that you should get, meaning you're not getting as much oxygen as you can get. You can start, you feel short of breath, you sort of are focusing on breathing. Normally we don't, we're just breathing, we're not thinking about it, it's very automatic, but it becomes not automatic when you're not getting enough air because your diaphragm's not functioning. But from a digestive standpoint, what happens is when that diaphragm bows down, it, it clamps off right uh, along your esophagus, around your esophagus in a, in a circle-like action. It's called a pinch cock system. So it pinches that esophagus and prevents any upward uh, motion of acid, bile, food, etc. Uh, and, and also, you know, keeps the stomach where it's supposed to be so you don't get a hiatal hernia. But when the, 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 that bowing down motion can't occur uh, as sufficiently as it wants to, over time, that upward pressure is starting to weaken that, that pinch cock system and things are then start moving upward, acid, your stomach, etc. Uh, so that's a, a, another sort of mechanical pressure aspect to it. Then we have chronic inflammation from these bad bacteria actually weaken some structures. So this is the fact that these small intestinal bacteria, um, they increase what's called endotoxins, which is toxins within the gut, and also a production of cytokines, which are inflammatory chemicals. But the, the key thing you have to know here is by virtue of them being present, this bacteria, it's weakening connective tissue like ligaments. So uh, the body has so many redundancies to make sure reflux doesn't happen, to make sure hiatal hernia doesn't happen. And there's a very important ligament that tethers your diaphragm down 
to anchor to your esophagus. So when you have this inflammation, it's actually weakening that ligament and it's getting stretched and it can even tear. And again, things are moving upward more than they're being tethered downward, which is the design that has to occur to prevent hiatal hernia and prevent acid reflux. And last but not least, we have the gut brain access and hypersensitivity. So again, these bacteria, what they're doing is they're uh, creating inflammation. They are diminishing your serotonin production. Serotonin has a lot to do with it's sort of a calm hormone and it um, typically uh, is influenced to being produced in your brain so that you're not moody and you're calm and you're relaxed, uh, which requires vagus nerve function. The way everything is intertwined is, is rather fascinating. Uh, but with the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you're altering serotonin production. And instead of, you know, if you're not calm, what are you? You're kind of jittery and anxious. And it actually does that to your nerves. So your nerves are more hypersensitive. The way this affects you is that the, the acid, you know, if you get sort of like a little trickle of acid, you wouldn't typically notice it versus excess acid. You're like, it's, it's burning. I'm feeling the reflux. It's, you know, I've got chest pain and you've got these miserable symptoms. But when the nerves are hypersensitized, a very little amount will create a big effect. And you're really feeling that. It's just that it's, it's, you're feeling it because the nerves are hypersensitized, not because it's legitimately that much reflux. So you're really feeling it. Then you get more and more drugs given to you, even though the root cause is, is this dysbiosis or uh, alteration of good bacteria, bad bacteria in your gut. So those are the five reasons. Now let's go over what you can do about it. So step one is you want to lower that pressure, obviously. And to do that, we have to stop feeding the bad bacteria because that's what's creating it. Now, uh, this is when we get into the arena of me letting you know I'm not your doctor, I'm not prescribing anything for you. I'm giving you data on how clinicians and how you can work with certain aspects of this, but I'm not prescribing. I'm not, I'm not taking the role of your doctor. So um, you need to find somebody to work with you. Uh, I am very partial to a natural approach to this because the natural approach works very, very well. And then we don't have to get into the side effects that a lot of drugs create, but you need to seek out help from a clinician that you feel comfortable with and, and get the help you need. Okay. So with that said, sometimes people are put on a low FODMAP diet uh, for SIBO. Other times just um, identifying food sensitivities is enough. Most certainly simple carbohydrates, ultra-processed ultra food, sugar, alcohol are, are no-nos. So you definitely want to change your diet to address that. Also sugar alcohols like xylitol and sorbitol um, can really feed these gas producers in particular with the SIBO. So, you know, you can say, well, it's sugar free, but um, in this particular case, those are not going to be your friend. Now we want to restore motility. We, we want you, we need that gut to start working again. We talked about the vagus nerve getting irritated and slowing everything down. Uh, ginger helps with this. Um, Iberagast helps with this. That's a uh, a supplement that is a combination of a lot of different herbs has been used kind of forever in Europe and finally came to the States uh, because what, what, what we want to do is we've got to get that motility back to where it should be. And of course, if you have constipation, magnesium citrate can, can assist. Ultimately, we want to really see in addition to the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, we also want to assess the uh, microbiome in your colon, in your large intestine, to see who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, and we want to, uh, you know, kill the bad guys and, and support the good guys. And, and that comes uh, more precisely from testing. That, that's what we do here. Okay. Then we want to relieve the pressure on the diaphragm, and addressing constipation can do that. Also, uh, looking at breathing techniques where sometimes the diaphragm has been pressurized for so long from that below up pressure so that it can't bow down the way it should that it's gotten weakened. So practicing your diaphragmatic breathing, your belly breathing, 
uh, physiological sigh, it's called, for the vagus nerve, which is you take a, a deep, deep, deep breath in, and then you let it out, you exhale as slowly as you possibly can. Also to relieve pressure, we want to reduce your visceral fat. So that's the fat around your organs. It's not the, the fat you can squeeze, which is your subcutaneous, so that means under the skin fat. It's that deep fat. And um, actually the dietary uh, ideas that I mentioned earlier can really help with that. It, you know, it's just eating real food. I know I shouldn't say just because it's a big deal for people to change their diet, but there's, we can't exaggerate at all the importance of eating real food and getting rid of the ultra process, getting rid of the sugar, getting rid of the alcohol, uh, because it does so many things. It does so many things for your health from diminishing your risk of diabetes and cancer and heart disease and dementia. Uh, you can't state firmly enough how important that is. And it's important here as well. So anything you can do to sort of migrate toward eating real food is is very critical okay then we want to reduce inflammation and what i just said about the diet very much fits into here also omega-3s you can do a test for your omega-3s again working with the clinician uh, to get you on a proper amount for you increasing your polyphenols in your diet and you can look up the foods there's many foods with polyphenols we tend to think of dark berries and green tea and uh, turmeric as a spice but there are there there's more that you want to look at there's green leafies in there that are that are very important and we don't tend to get enough polyphenols in this country so they're very anti-inflammatory and delicious you just find the ones you like okay also to reduce inflammation things like aloe uh, DGL which is deglycerized licorice uh, glutamine zinc carnosine and also collagen and vitamin C to strengthen connective tissue I mentioned that ligament uh, issue that happens with the bacteria so to strengthen your connective tissue vitamin c collagen is very very helpful and then supporting last but not least your gut brain axis and this is where stress stress i can say this stress management comes in prioritizing your sleep um, prioritizing exercise it's very important to reduce stress and the various breathing techniques uh, the box breathing physiological sigh uh, and I mentioned how to do that a, a little bit ago. And then last but not least, microbiome support. So you're, you want to balance your entire microbiome. A lot of times the treatment addresses the SIBO first and then goes deeper in the colon because sometimes what you're doing to, um, if, if you're giving probiotics sometimes, that can feed the bad bacteria that, that's making the SIBO. So you have to do it in the right order. Again, working with the clinician is, is really, really helpful. Bottom line, you don't have to suffer with this. This is uh, very much a natural methodology to address these things. And yes, there's mechanical and there's neurological and there's inflammatory, but they're all natural. And I think what I love about it is that uh, the programs that we utilize here at Root Cause are, are completely following what this research said. Uh, I'm filming this, it's early September 2025. It just came out at the end of August 2025. So brand new research, very exciting. I love the fact that researchers are looking at this. This is, this is good news. And so we, we know that this is research backed. And uh, again, there's so much you can do to feel better. I hope you enjoyed this video and you found it informative. If you did, consider liking it and subscribing. We're definitely trying to increase our subscribers so that more people can get this information and know what their choices are for their health. And then send me a comment, please. I love hearing from you all and I answer pretty much everyone. So we'll talk soon.